Hello, welcome. You are listening to Dr. Shushma Singh. Today we start Unit 19, Warrior Alvin and G.S. Ghurye's Perspective on Tribe. Tribes in India belong to various regions, cultures, linguistic groups. It is not necessary that they be forest dwellers. Some are from the northeast zone, some from the desert, some forest dwellers, while some migrated to cities for work and livelihood. In this blog, we have already learned about the diversity of the tribe in India and their place in wider society in India. In this unit on Warriors Alvin and G.S. Ghurye's perspective on tribe, we have explained explained the debate which has its origin in post-independence India. It was argued by Alvin, an anthropologist, that the tribes are distinct communities, therefore they need protection in their natural environment. But G.S. Gurriyes, a sociologist, believed that tribes are a part of larger Hindu community and should be so recognized. This debate about tribes has been extensively described in this unit. Now let us move to the point, the framing of the tribal question, Alvin and Gurye. The autonomy and independence of tribal people in India is circumscribed by the legal regime laid out in the 5th and the 6th schedule of the Constitution of India. Their population is distributed over all the states except Chandigarh, Delhi, Haryana, Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh and Pandicherry. A big percentage inhabits a large contiguous geographical belt that divides India into northern and southern parts. This belt ex- extends from northeast frontier region into the Santhal Parganas and the Chota Nagpur Plateau in West Bengal and Bihar, into Odisha and Andhra Pradesh in the southeast of into Madhya Pradesh in central India up to Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, in West India. Outside this belt there are pockets inhabited by tribal people in North and South India. The tribal population is socially, culturally, economically and politically differentiated on account of the different histories of interaction between them and the known tribal people. There are only a few places where tribal population dwell in deep forests and continue to practice shifting cultivation, for instance, in Abu Jamahar, in Bastar, Madhya Pradesh, and in Koraput and Pulbhani in Orissa. A majority of them, however, live on wastelands in settled agriculture regions in towns and cities. Their mode of earning a livelihood varies from teaching in school and colleges to white-collar jobs to running small shops to industrial entrepreneurs. Economically, a large number are poor because either they are landless labor or they are cultivators with small unproductive land holdings. Some are rich and some belong to the middle class. The tribal workforce is disturbed over the following categories. Cultivators, agricultural workers, livestock, forestry worker, mining and Quarry workers, construction workers, workers in trade and commerce sectors, workers in transport, shortage, storage and communication sectors, and workers in other services. 
this includes white collar jobs school teachers etc culturally the t- tribal language of india can be grouped into two major families the austric the tibeto chinese the dravidian and the indo aryans brixson's linguistic survey of india recorded 179 languages and 1544 dialects of the 179 languages 116 were enumerated as tribal languages and dialects the tribal of nagaland alone spoke 55 dialects as for as their linguistic skills are concerned they are bilingual if not multilingual over years of interaction with the known tribal people a large majority has converted either to hinduism or christianity or buddhism or islam and has also moved away from their tradition of work this has influenced not only their linguistic ability but also their thought pattern modern development has created conditions on the one hand that discourages the use of their mother tongue and on the other hand to use the mother tongue as a medium of education it is not co- uncommon to observe that converted tribal people use their mother tongue to communicate the content of religion they have adopted only those who live in deep forest continue to practice their own religion unlike those who have converted their mother tongue is also the language of their thought the legal regime laid out in the 5th and 6th schedule has its origin in the act of 1935 which created excluded and partially excluded areas where a different set of laws would govern the life of tribal people alvins pointed out section 52 and 92 of act provided for the reservation of certain predominantly aboriginal area to be known as excluded or partially excluded areas from the operation of provincial legislature the executive of authority of provinces extend extends to excluded and partially excluded areas therein but the administration of excluded areas is under the govern of at his discretion and partially excluded areas are administered by the ministers subject to the special responsibility for their peace and good environment am- imposed on the governor by the section 52e of the act thus the governor is given the power to control the application of legislature whether of the federal or provincial legislature and make regulations in both these areas after the act gurie formulated the tribal questions there are three views on the tribal situation no change and revivalism isolation and preservations and the finally assimilation this was a reflection of how he saw the tribal situation in 1943 he saw them divided into three cat classes first such as the rajgond and others who have successfully fought the battle and are recognized as members of a fairly high status within hindu society second the large mass that has been partially hinduized and has come into closer contact with hindu and third the hill section which have exhibited the greatest power of resistance to alien cultures that have pressed upon their borders 
In this classification, he missed out on Christian influence. In Alvin's view, the second class has suffered moral depression and decay as a result of contact from which the third has been largely free. Alvin was anti-missionary and pro-Hindu as regards the future of the tribal people. In 1944, he wrote, missionaries should be withdrawn from the partially excluded areas. We insist that all education in these areas should be taken over by government. We demand that government should do twice as much as missionaries have achieved. We have no interest in keeping these people backward. If they are to take their place as Kshatriyas in Hindu social system, then they must be trained in the arts of liberal thinking and educated to encourage and traditions of honor. Like him, Gurye said to enable the so-called aborigines to live their lives according to their traditions and custom without active interference from known aborigines is certainly a desirable and as natural as the grant of responsibility in their administration to other people. But to exclude these tracks from the operation of the full institution for this purpose implies that the facilities for such a life are likely to be denied by a general community. If the so-called aborigines are placed under the same administrative and political machinery, this is not borne out by history. It is clear that both Halvin and Gurye argued for assimilation into the Hindu fold. In 1950, after debate in the Constitution Assembly, the partially excluded and the excluded areas became the fifth and sixth scheduled areas. Tribal development programs were initiated and the Guri Alvin position remained unquestioned. On the ground, tribal people has no choice other than to become part of mainstream and get assimilated into the Hindu fold or become part of Christianity. Today, four NGOs and political activists, primarily in the fifth schedule area, the Buria Committee report and the subsequent act of 1996 is an important step towards the realization of self-rule for tribal people in India. These concern, concerns resonate the demand for tribal autonomy in the sixth schedule area in the northeast frontier region of India. The Act of 1996 emphasized that traditional tribal conventions and laws should continue to hold validity. Harmonization with modern systems should be consistent herewith. The committee felt that while shaping the new Panchayati Raj structure in tribal area, it is desirable to blend the traditional with the modern by treating the traditional institutions as the foundation on which the modern superstructure should be built. To what extent does this legal regime equip the tribal people to move towards self-rule? What does self-rule mean? when there are only a few tribal people who have not become what they are not, that is, have not adopted non-tribal religions and cultures. What part of their tradition remains that can harmonize with modern system? Perhaps the answer to these questions is not possible within the Alvin Gurye framework because firstly the tribal people are classified 
into three mutually exclusive classes secondly the tribal relation with a non tribal people is looked at from the point of view of the state finally there is no effort to hear the voice of tribal people as it is articulated through their struggles before the act of 1935 was passed in other word gurie's view gives legitimacy to the legal regime set up by the state it in fact is a form of counter insurgency because it upholds the value of tradition but takes away its existential ground of subsistability the forest life world here we want to close this lecture thanks for listening